Hi, welcome everybody. Great to see you all. See uh, these happy faces on a Friday. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Valerie Roshan, President and Chief Collaborator for the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth. Also on the call with us today uh, from the staff is Ben Van Camp, our uh, VP of What's Next. He's always driving the bus, the Zoom bus for us. And uh, Jen Stevens, our communications guru, are, are on the line with us today. So um, welcome and thank you for being here. I think we also have, uh, we're expecting the city manager, Karen Connard, and uh, of course, uh, Stephanie Secord, the uh, brilliant mind behind the, the advisories that come out from the city, among many other things. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. You're all on mute, and uh, we ask that you use the chat function to ask questions. We will have our speakers speak first, both of them, and then Ben will open it up for Q&A. He'll be moderating that section. You know, we've never, I hate to say this, because, but we've never been um, hijacked on these calls and we hope that we don't, but if we do, Ben will shut down the call immediately and we'll try to reschedule. And remember that all Chamber Chat live events are recorded and we put them up on our website and out on our YouTube channel so you can see them later. Today, we are very pleased to welcome two members of the Health Subcommittee of the Portsmouth Citizens Response Task Force, and that's Ann Berner, the chair of Farm D. I'll tell you more about her in a few minutes, and Dr. Bianca Montero from York Hospital. So we will, uh, I'll tell you more about both of them in a few minutes. I'm, I'm uh, lucky to see them on a, on a very regular basis on our task force. So um, they have agreed to join us today, thankfully. Some quick chamber news. If you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you're missing a lot of good stuff and you're losing some, losing some uh, important information as well. So Facebook, follow us uh, at uh, Portsmouth Chamber, and on Instagram and Twitter, you can follow us on at Ports Chamber. And of course, uh, for all the news about what's open, what's not open, our hotels, restaurants, retail, activities and attractions, you should go to course, GoPortsmouthNH.com or follow us on Facebook, GoPortsmouthNH. So let me give you a quick update on the Citizens Response Task Force. The Public Realm Subcommittee on which I sit is switching gears now. We've got pretty much everybody who's, almost everybody who's submitted a request for a permit to get out onto the street or the sidewalk has been approved and they are out there. The city has done an amazing job. Sometimes we approve them uh, during the day and by the end of the day, those concrete barriers are out there. It's amazing the work that they've been doing. So um, but now we're switching gears to look towards the fall and winter and, and what we're going to be able to, to do to accommodate and to help our businesses for the fall and winter time. As you know, Pop-Up New Hampshire opened last weekend on the Bridge Street lot and today you can enjoy food and drink from Vita Cantina and the two staples that are on the lot, Black Trumpet and Camp Sippa Brew. Tomorrow, the Wilder, Wilder will join in place of Vita, along with the concert at 8 o'clock by Sam Robbins. And Sunday, you can enjoy food and beverage by Dos Amigos, in addition to the Black Trumpet and Camp Sipper Group. Visit popupnh.org for the schedule and to purchase tickets. Uh, the third subcommittee of the task force is health, and you're going to hear from Anne and Bianca shortly. I want to bring you up to date on the uh, BEA, Business and Economic Affairs, and the Chamber Regional Partnership. The application to, was due today from each of the seven regions around the state to receive some of the funding, the $2 million that was allocated by the Gopher Committee to um, uh, from the CARES Act funding, the $1.2 billion the state got from the CARES Act funding. And so we have submitted from our Seacoast Chamber Alliance, our collection of six Seacoast Chambers. We've got a great program that we've developed that includes economic recovery, workforce development. Um, we're going to develop a landing page, uh, some destination marketing for the entire seacoast, and communications, and what am I missing? Anyway, we have a great, great program. Oh, safe, seacoast safe. 
getting out the messaging about Seco Safe and asking our our uh, businesses to pledge to do everything possible to keep our their staff and customers safe. And remember, there's a lot of you who are looking for staff. Please remember that we have a jobs board. Upload your open positions on our jobs board at PortsmouthCollaborative.org. If you have trouble getting into your, your section of the database, of our database to do that, you can give uh, Ben a shout, ben at PortsmouthCollaborative.org. So send him a quick email. Um, I also want to talk about Connect and Collaborate. So we started this Connect and Collaborate about a year ago, Ben, I think. Uh, Susan Gold has been the fantastic leader of that group and so successful that we've just started Connect and Collaborate too. So that is a referral group that welcomes one chamber member from each industry. And if you're interested in learning more, please contact Ben. It's, it's a great group of folks in CNC1. And I was able to meet the folks in CNC2 last week. I think it was last week. Um, and they are they a great group. You're going to really enjoy them. So our first speaker today is Ann Berner, who is the chair of Farm D. Ann served as clinical pharmacist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, where she specialized in the care of immunocompromised patients, sterile product prep, and infection control. Her prior work in the pharmaceutical industry included the design and impl implementation of clinical trials and the interpretation and publication of results and their applications. So Ann sits on the health subcommittee of the Portsmouth Citizens Response Task Force. And as I said, I'm very lucky to be able to get to know Ann on that task force. So Ann, welcome. Thank you. Are you ready for me to begin? Whenever you're ready. All right. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Valerie. Um, the, the details about my career were lifted from my application to this task force. And so uh, in that application, I tried to emphasize the features of my career that were most applicable to the pandemic. But um, just to be a little more broad, I was a pharmacist specializing in hematology and oncology. So that's what I was doing at Dartmouth. And um, I wanted to make that clear because I did mention infection control but I don't wanna present myself, for example, as an infectious disease specialist. So just trying to make that clear for everyone. Now, a few words about the Citizen Response Task Force. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this organization, but I did wanna lay, lay the groundwork with just a few details. This uh, task force was established by the Portsmouth City Council in May. It was proposed by uh, two members of the council and members were selected. And then the first meeting was held on June 9th of this year. And the, the representation on the membership is I think quite broad and suitable for the goals of this uh, task force, which we will look at shortly. It's representative of the Chamber of Commerce with Valerie, of course, the arts community, healthcare organizations, healthcare professionals, that would be Bianca and myself, but there is some cross pollination or uh, however you want to state it, because, um, for example, there is a nurse who's representing um, a nonprofit. So, um, again, a broad representation, restaurants, retail businesses, the hotel industry is represented, and the Economic Development Commission. Now, um, the emphasis here is on, you know, recognizing what Portsmouth is as a city, you know, we, we are a city that cares about its residents, but also has a strong tourist industry. And so I think, um, I'm sure all of that went into the thinking behind this and what kinds of individuals, what kinds of representation the council wanted to have. I also have to mention city staff. We have the city manager on all of on uh, the council, on the task force and on most of the calls. I think she's been on all of the calls so far, the Zoom meetings. And we are also fortunate to have Kim McNamara from Public Health. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we interact with the city staff when I get into more detail about how our subcommittee functions. So this is the charge to the task force when it was pulled together. And I'd like to focus on a few aspects here. First of all, that the business community and organizations are the focus. So with things like the pool being open or not being open, school reopening, that sort of thing is really beyond our scope. We are to recommend to the city management and council on decisions related to COVID-19 that affect the business community and organization. And in particular, reopening, because at the time, of course, during the springtime, everything other than essential businesses was pretty much closed down. So we were then looking forward to reopening. And now, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with reopening, but now we're thinking about um, it, it's not the opposite of reopening, but it's a different kind of reopening where we'll be moving things indoors. And Valerie, of course, already alluded to that. And we want to do all of this within the confines of healthcare advisories. Um, we want to, to uh, recognize that things are changing. So in the second bullet point, we're talking here about best practices. And when you think about how much we've learned about the coronavirus since May, uh, every day you open up the papers or you turn on the news and there, there's new information. Things are getting better. Things might be getting worse, depending on where you are and what's happening. We're learning more about how the virus infects individuals, how it's transmitted from one individual to another. And so, uh, you know, when you talk about best practices and healthcare advisories, uh, these, are, these are definitely in a state of flux. And so, you know, it's important that we be mindful of that. And a decision that's made at one point in time might need to be reconsidered at another point in time, of course. Uh, recommendations for the business community addressing the needs of healthcare safety. Not much more to say about that. Um, masks is number four. And this has been a hot topic, I think, from very early on in the pandemic. Um, particularly here in the United States. And we have done some work, quite a bit of work actually, around the subject of masks. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly as well. So this is um, a very inclusive task force. We want to work with citizen and business interests, but of course, we're also thinking about employees who may not be residents, but you know, basically anyone who's within our city limits, whether they're citizens, visitors, employees, we want to protect the health of all of these individuals as best we can. And then of course, the financial impact of the pandemic on businesses. And just speaking for myself personally, not necessarily everyone on the health subcommittee, but I have to say that from the very first call back in early June, um, when I joined the subcommittee, I was thinking about health care, um, you know, what can we do to protect people? How can, we, how can we limit the extent of damage done by the virus? I hadn't been thinking so much about it from a business perspective, but once I started to hear how people are suffering and how businesses are suffering and the impact this has had on others' lives, you know, of course, I've, I had heard about it and read about it in the news, but hearing it firsthand has really um, given me, I think, some empathy and understanding for what people are going through from a different perspective. So that for me personally has been kind of eye opening. So this is the structure and function slide. And um, we are, as I, I think Valerie mentioned this earlier, the um, task force itself meets weekly via Zoom and reports to the city council. And Valerie mentioned the subcommittees. Uh, the public realm, Valerie, I think I called it the downtown streets. It's, um, you know, an, a rose by any other name, right? But the, these two subcommittees were formed at the first task force meeting, I believe. That was the downtown streets. So opening up the streets, uh, blocking off sections of the streets or sidewalks and trying to make space for businesses restaurants in particular that were moving outdoors because of the restrictions on indoor dining. And um, in addition, we had a subcommittee for the Portsmouth pop-up, which had already kind of been fermenting in individuals' minds. And uh, so our task force took it on, um, developed a sub 
subcommittee to look at that. And I think I saw the chair of that subcommittee is on this, is listening in on this call. Um, they've done a wonderful job, both of these subcommittees, really done a lot of great work. I happened to look down on one of the restaurants that was able to open up outdoors. My balcony looks down on the street. And um, it's really been wonderful to see people enjoying the outdoors in that way. And then after we had been meeting for maybe a month or so, the question was raised as an agenda item on a, on a task force call, um, what else should we be thinking about? They, we had kind of started to get a grip on using the downtown streets and the pop-up. What else should we be thinking about? So I knew at that time that everybody was thinking about the coronavirus and the pandemic, you know, and we were alluding to it, but I, I raised the question, you know, should be we should we be looking at this in a more systematic way? And so um, before I knew it, we had a health subcommittee and I was the chair and we were looking at the data, but we also had some other responsibilities that have been handed to our subcommittee and we're doing our, our best to meet those requests as well. We, uh, all of the subcommittees meet uh, as we feel the need arises. So for us on health, it's been a weekly meeting and our meeting takes place on Tuesday. So on Monday, we, we meaning Stephanie Secord, our wonderful public information colleague at the city, has uh, drawn up every Monday a draft report on coronavirus data. And you will be learning more about that because Bianca will be walking you through this week's, this week's report shortly. So that comes out either fr uh, Monday night or Tuesday morning. So we have a chance to look at it. Then we have our meeting on Tuesdays. And then we uh, hustle around to get everything ready for the Wednesday call, which is the full task force. All of the meetings for all of these subcommittees and the task force itself are posted on the city website and are open to the public. Oh, I did want to mention on the regular reports to the city council, our co-chairs are Mark Stebbins and James Peterson. And from the start, I believe they've been giving reports to the city council at its regular meetings. And then uh, the subcommittees have begun to do that as well. So the health subcommittee, our first meeting was on July 9th. And here you can see our membership. We have uh, a pharmacist, myself, a physician, that's Bianca, who's on the call. And we have two advanced practice nurses. And then we have uh, James Peterson, who is a professional engineer. And especially now that we're thinking about moving back indoors as the weather turns poor and spending more time indoors uh, with schools reopening, whether that is remotely or, you know, possibly part-time and eventually we hope uh, more than part-time in the school building, these things are going to become very important to understand from a perspective of things like ventilation and how the virus moves about and how heating and cooling systems and air filtration systems might impact these decisions. So it's really been wonderful to have an engineer on the task force with us. It's been extremely helpful. I did mention the city employees. We have a uh, public information represented, that's Stephanie Secord, and um, she's done an incredible job with some of the things that we've asked her to do with quick turnaround times and, and very responsive to our recommendations and suggestions for how documents should look. Anything that's public facing, Stephanie is our go-to person. And then public health, we have Kim McNamara, and uh, if and when she's not available, she has two colleagues, Kristen, um, Shaw, Kristen Shaw, and uh, Tony McClelland. Uh, to repeat myself a little bit, maybe I can't say enough about these partners that we're working with. When I stop to think about the fact that they all had full-time jobs before the pandemic and how much additional work this must mean for them, it really boggles my mind how hard they're working and what a good job they're doing from my perspective. So this is what we're doing on this subcommittee and what we plan to do. I already mentioned the weekly dashboard and that you'll get a closer look at that shortly. Uh, masks, that has been a big topic right from the start. You noticed our first meeting was on July 9th. It was just a few days before the city of Portsmouth had a meeting to review and ultimately did unanimously endorse 
a resolution around the use of masks in our city. Uh, so prior to that, we were able to get a letter out to the city endorsing that concept. We, we listened in on the call. Our letter was referenced during that call on July 13th. And uh, subsequently, because we heard some misinformation during the comment time on that call, we developed a facts and clarification memo on mask usage and viral transmission that we sent to the city council. And um, we, we sort of, we, we felt that that was worthwhile and we will be doing, um, we, we will be undertaking similar documents in the future. And um, I'll talk about that in a moment. But publicity, Stephanie has worked on press releases um, she's making some efforts, perhaps, to get Bianca from our subcommittee um, to have some interviews and get some more information out there about our subcommittee and maybe some advice for the public. Uh, that sort of crosses over with outreach. We are in the process of, we sent a letter to Governor Sununu encouraging a mask mandate, and we, um, we are working on a, a broader and perhaps modified letter. We have one in draft to be sent out to other cities and towns that interact on a regular basis with Portsmouth because um, what we're doing is, is basically confined to the city limits, but we recognize the fact that we have kids coming from other towns and attending our schools. We have people using our facilities and vice versa. We have buses going back and forth from Portsmouth to other cities and towns, for example, people coming in to be treated at our hospital or Portsmouth residents going elsewhere for treatment in other towns. So um, we have a, a letter that we're drafting to interact with those towns and, and discuss some of these issues. As far as autumn plans, I mentioned the facts and clarifications memo that we had sent out. We are in the process of developing similar documents. Uh, the next one that we'll, we'll develop, we'll be calling it instead of clarifications and facts, we'll be referring to it as a frequently asked questions, an FAQ document. Right now we're working on a document, an FAQ document that will address um, coronavirus testing, the different types of testing that can be done, the turnaround times, the availability, how they're done. So a lot of this is information that's in the public domain and it's it's out there for people to find, but we're going to try to draw it in together into a, a simple and straightforward document that's tailored for the needs of our city. So what's available right here in Portsmouth, for example, in terms of um, testing. And then we, we have haven't firmly decided upon this yet, but we're talking about in our autumn plans and with thinking about moving indoors, um, maybe another FAQ that will discuss how the virus is transmitted, in particular indoors versus outdoors, the role for proper ventilation, whether air filtration and different systems might be able to help and that sort of thing. Um, we haven't reached a firm conclusion on that, but that's something we're considering doing as a, as a next step. So that is it from me. And now that I'm finished with these slides, I'll be handing it over to Bianca and she'll be walking you through the most recent example of our weekly dashboard. I am now unmuted. So <laughs> thank you, Anne. That was uh, very comprehensive and I appreciate all of the work that you've been doing on the health subcommittee, on the task force, and certainly to pull that presentation together to explain what it is that particularly the health subcommittee has been doing. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, next up is Dr. Bianca Montero. Um, she is a pulmonary critical care MD and the medical director for the intensive care unit at York Hospital. In that role, she assisted York Hospital in the creation of their COVID-19 response for inpatient care and for the reopening of outpatient care. She also served as a consultant to CrossFit Portsmouth to implement protocols for their safe reopening. And I know that she's got a very busy day today and she's, I think, um, if I can let the cat out of the bag playing hooky from a course that she's taking for this hour, um, to join us today. So I really appreciate that you've done that, Bianca. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Valerie, for this uh, kind invitation. So let me share the screen here. And what I really uh, want to start is with the Open here a little more, okay. more visible. There we go. So, this is what the weekly dashboard looks like. So, it changes every week in preparation for our Wednesday meetings. And this was created uh, mostly by Stephanie Secord, which who did a fantastic job putting all this information together because it's a very busy um, sheet, and we wanted to try to put the most pertinent clinical information in one page and have everything in there. And what we used here was basically information from John Hopkins' website, from the New York Times, and also the CDC, the local CDC from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, in Maine. And the idea of this dashboard was not only to present the actual number of cases and testing and positivity rate for our um, area in New Hampshire, but also any of the other states that are next to us, our neighbors, Massachusetts in Maine, which we share a lot, lot of um, as colleagues for work, for tourists. So we felt that it was important to add all this together there. So it's basically divided in four parts. The first part that you see there on top which the first two pictures is the number of active cases, current cases that you see. And the top picture, which has different shades uh, from yellow to red, uh, is basically the confirmed cases up to date in the area. And you see the darker shades are the higher numbers of uh, confirmed cases. And as you know, Massachusetts had most of the, the cases throughout the pandemic. Uh, our area, Rockingham, and the Manchester area, Nashua, York County, and Portland uh, counties as well, Cumberland counties. And the second picture in the bottom you see more is um, the actual um, deaths uh, that were attributed to those cases. Um, again, uh, from lighter sort of uh, um, light, lilac to deep purple, you see, or blue, you see also from last cases to uh, deaths to higher number of deaths. And again, as you can see, Massachusetts had most of the, uh, the cases and, and deaths, the same as the southern portion of the state. So that's the first part. The second part, as you can see here, is the what we call the positivity rate, which is from total number of tests, how many are actually positive? And then we divide it by New Hampshire, Maine and Massachusetts. And that varies almost every day and every week, right? It depends on how many tests were performed, how many positive cases we got out of it. And sort of we kind of like to look at it as a trend and a seven day trend. So as you can see, this is for this week that we presented uh, last Wednesday. And as you can see here in New Hampshire, currently had a trend down in the number of cases. There were 17 cases as of Monday when we prepared this. Um, and 1.9 a positivity rate. And I'm going to talk about the positivity rate in a little bit. Maine had 16 new cases, a 0 0.5 positivity rate, which is a fantastic number. Massachusetts had 329 new cases and 2.4 uh, of positivity rate. And people talk, well, what is the ideal number? There's really not a set of numbers that we really have. It kind of varies, but we, the epidemiologists and the CDC discussed that to at least consider for reopening, it needs to be less than 5%. And to really consider that it is the disease and the, the pandemic is completely under control or close to be under control is less than 1%. So we still have a little bit to go. We are actually in good position this week. It's much less than the previous two, as I think we were about 2.3 to 2.4 in the last two weeks, we went down. So Maine is probably doing the best. And then so the last portion of this has two pieces. One, we just put it this, probably you've seen if you uh, check the New York Times often, it has this um, uh, graph with the map of the United States, right? And has different colors, again, from light yellow to red where the hot spots are. So just to have an idea where at the moment, the hot spots are all more into the south of the country and in the west. If you look at our area in New England, it's um, 
pretty uh, light yellow, pretty much under control. And the last piece of information that we add here, which is uh, very difficult to see, because let's see if I can sort of zoom in a little bit. Um, so what you see here in this graph, um, there are three components. The blue line is actually percentage of positive tests. That goes to the positivity rate. And then in the very bottom, if you look a little bit um, in darker, sort of a coral, you have daily positive tests. And more into the yellow, you have the total tests done. So as you can see, going back into April and early May, um, positivity rates were really high, but we were not testing that much also. So we were mostly, we didn't have enough tests, so we were mostly testing those that had symptoms and most likely had the disease. And that's why our positivity rate was so high. And as we increased the number of tests and did also all the other measurements, right, and for mitigation, we did improve our positivity rate and now it's sitting just short of 2%. Um, this is all data, again, that we have access to and it's public, it's published in the CrossFit, um, CrossFit the, the, the Citizen Task Force. Uh, it's also uh, published in um, different uh, websites, the COVID tra uh, tracking data.com, John Hopkins uh, website. They all have access to those, um, those graphs. Um, so this is pretty much the dashboard that we have every week. And I have one final slide that I would like to share before we move on to the Q&A. Just give me a minute here. Can you see my, my final slide here? Okay, good. We just wanted to end with a few thoughts about uh, the, the keys to disease control. I'm sure that everyone has heard this, but I think it's, uh, we, we cannot emphasize it enough. After looking at the data that Bianca shared with us, I think compared to the rest of the country, not necessarily compared to the rest of the world, but compared to the rest of the country, we are doing relatively well here in in New Hampshire and, and uh, the adjacent coast of Maine. Uh, we wanna keep it that way. We need to remain vigilant. And uh, these are the key steps uh, we think that will help with disease control. So not only protecting ourselves, but protecting the public health. Um, again, you've heard it before, but we just have to reiterate, wear a mask, sanitize your hands, wash with soap and water. And if you can't use a sanitizer with a sufficient amount of alcohol, Avoid crowded places, keep a physical distance, uh, six feet at least, ideally a minimum of six feet, and uh, indoors versus outdoors. Again, we're, we're talking about the fall. It seems like we just barely got opened up for the summertime, but uh, this nice weather won't, won't last. Eventually we'll be moving things indoors, but for now, you know, any activities that can take place outdoors as opposed to indoors, uh, that's the better way to go. So. I, with that, I think that we can end and move on to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Anne, and thank you, Bianca. That was, um, you know, I look forward to that dashboard every week because I, it changes so quickly. And, and it's so interesting to see that dashboard and what's going on and how New Hampshire is faring versus our surrounding states. So uh, we know that Massachusetts is struggling, has been struggling, and they've done a great job, I think, of, uh, of bringing the numbers down. But, but still, uh, we need to, as you say, we need to always, we need to continue to be on alert. I do want to try to focus a bit on uh, what you just talked about, Anne, which is getting, getting inside. And what the dashboard and what your knowledge and what your information is from, from both of your perspectives, Bianca and Anne, the things that we need to be looking at as we're going inside. And I know that you've you mentioned working with James and having that engineering experience. 
to think about what it is that our businesses can do to help people feel safe to go in, indoors. The thing that we're hearing in all consumer confidence surveys is that people are simply not comfortable. They're just not sure if they're gonna be safe or not. And so if you can share from your perspectives what needs to happen, what you're looking at in the health subcommittee that will help inform our businesses, that would be that would be helpful. And I and I know that we're far, far away from any decisions and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But I also think that the, the two of you have some insight that the rest of us might not have. Uh, Bianca, do you want me to start? And Yeah, you can go ahead. I'll go next. Uh, well, I, I just want to say, I think that um, what, what we're doing right now is just barely getting started. Um, again, we've, we've only been meeting since uh, the since July, we've only had about a month's worth of meetings. And so we have we feel like we've accomplished quite a bit. And yet we, we recognize that we need to start thinking about moving indoors, but we're really very early on in this. Um, James has been extremely helpful. And uh, we, we have a limited amount of time on our, during our Zoom meetings, but we put him first on the next meeting so that he can have plenty of time and continue to enlighten us. Um, we've talked a little bit about things like what kinds of filtration systems in heating and cooling. And I understand that there has been a recent change to the filtration systems in the, um, in the Portsmouth schools, but it's not clear to me yet how efficacious or, or how much of a difference that might make. Um, you know, I just from my own personal reading, this isn't something that's coming through from the uh, subcommittee formally, but I was reading a very interesting article about <laughs> back in the days of over 100 years ago, the days of the so-called Spanish flu and uh, classes being taught outdoors on ferries in the wa over the water in New York City and, and uh, throughout New England, even during the coldest part of the year. So I thought that was interesting. You know, we, we do feel that it is safer to be outdoors. I'm not sure we're ready to take that extreme, but um, we've talked about things like ultraviolet light. You know, is it helpful? I don't know the answer to that question. And um, again, you know, not being an infectious disease specialist or an epidemiologist, it's been a pretty steep learning curve for me. We, we hope to continue and, and come up with some useful guidance for the task force and for the city. But, um, you know, when, I, when it comes to these really important decisions, um, we we want to learn what the experts know and then relay that to you. And we're, we're just kind of barely getting underway with that at this point. Bianca? Yeah, so I think in addition to uh, looking into the ventilation systems and uh, ultraviolet light and HVAC, the filters, I think we have to sort of think about how can we safely move inside and when I think about that, although not being an epidemiologist, I still think we have to apply the knowledge that we already have and know, meaning um, rearranging the office space, rearranging the restaurant space or uh, the store, wearing masks. Um, I think contact tracing is very important. If you have people that come to an office space, uh, five people, 10 people, I think knowing uh, which days of the week they worked or having customers that need to stay for more than 30 minutes to an hour into a store, sort of know, so having information about contact tracing. And then beyond that, I also think that this is more into sort of a city and state is continue with testing. I think having a lot of testing, it's it's never enough because that's how we're going to know, you know, that when well, we just had a test, I know I don't have any contacts with anybody who's been sick. My neighbor is negative. My colleague at work is negative. So this is how we know that everybody that we interact with are not infectious. So I think that's also important. Um, I think in the beginning it would be really hard to have, for example, in a restaurant, that's the easiest one in which I think most people are concerned, right? have 100% capacity. But I think rearranging the whole layout of a restaurant and wearing masks as much as possible, not when, not when you're sitting down and eating, and then having the ventilation system, if possible, because that might be very costly. I think it's the way to go, in addition to testing and tracing. 
One other thing I'd like to mention, and I'd welcome your thoughts on this too, Bianca, is that um, I... I think personally, I hear some misunderstanding about the use of mask and physical distancing. It doesn't need to be one or the other. Um, the mask is even more important if you can't maintain that six foot distance. But, you know, if you can do both, and especially if we're moving indoors and, uh, you know, it's uh, a, an area that might be a little bit crowded, but you can barely maintain the six foot distancing. Um, I think, you know, not just considering each factor individually, but doing as much as we can all at once. Yeah. Great. Uh, this is Ben. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, coming in. Uh, one from uh, one of your task force members, um, the esteemed Mr. Russ Grazier. So I'm going to um, unmute Russ here and he's unmuted. So I'll let him jump in there. Um, thank you, Anne and Bianca, for all of your work. It's been amazing working with you on the task force, and I learn more and more each time I, I hear you speak, so I'm so glad that I'm here today. Um, my question has to dive further deep, uh, or ask you to dive deeper into the idea of dealing with ventilation systems and HVAC systems. Um, like a lot of nonprofits in the state of New Hampshire, we learned this week that we received a significant grant and CARES Act funds through the Nonprofit Emergency Relief Fund. And about $20,000 of that grant that we've received is going to be designated to retrofitting an ionization system into our HVAC units in the building to improve our uh, ventilation system. We've already upgraded to MERV 13 filters on our own. And we're doing everything we can to create the safest indoor environment. What I'm concerned about is investing a lot of money in an HVAC system and then being told in two months that it's not good enough. And, you know, and worrying about a good allocation of resources. So I don't know. I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. But, you know, what's the best advice that you think? Oh, you cut out there, Russ. Oh. In their systems for safety purposes. You cut out right at the end. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So just what, what advice you can give businesses who are investing significant money in uh, upgrading their systems and, and how we should approach that? Um, I Again, I, if you don't mind, Bianca, I'll kick it off by saying that um, we learning more about the role of professional engineers in this area. And um, there's an organization called ASHRAE, A-S-H-R-A-E. And uh, I learned from James last week that this is the organization that produces, that writes and uh, writes and distributes guidelines on various topics such as this. I don't know if they have anything yet, but again, not being an expert in, in, in heating and cooling or in epidemiology, I would say, you know, find the experts, find the organization and, uh, you know, see what they have to say. I'm sorry if that seems like I'm skirting your question, but that's the best I can do at this point in time. If I may just uh, uh, sort of answer to it. Russ, this is a very good question. And it's one of those that we probably don't know the answer to that completely, right? I mean, COVID, it's something that uh, we're still learning a lot from it. Initially, it was all droplet. Now there's concerns of airborne. You know, it looks like by the initial data and studies that ionization and all those filters may help. But again, in two or three months, more comprehensive studies may come out. So I think it's probably just wise to stay in touch with engineers in that area, sort of genes. And because he's always in contact with the professors and universities that are testing this constantly. And it might be unfortunately the case that you spend all this money and then something else may come up. You know, it looks good right now, but it's, it's something that we just don't know in two months. Great. Uh, thanks for that question, Russ. Uh, another question, and this is uh, one you may want to skirt as well, because it's a little bit outside the purview of the, uh, task force, but you guys both being very well-informed individuals. Um, the question came through, and I find it ironic because I had to make this very decision today. If you had school-aged children, would you send them to school? Bianca, do you want to go first for a change? <laughs> yeah, I can go first. <laughs> you know, first of all, I have to say that I don't have children, so uh, I'm 
it, this is not, it's a completely probably uh, unbiased uh, response uh, and a very ambiguous answer. My, my answer will be, it depends. I think, um, I think it would depend of my community numbers, what kind of mitigation and control, disease control they're doing. I think if I had to participate in some decision making, I would probably do a combination of a little bit of in home and a little bit of in, in person and sort of alternate the kids there and not have all the kids in, in the class at the same time. I think there are a lot of kids and it'd probably be really hard to put them all together every single day. And again, it goes back to a lot of tracing and contact, maybe cohort the kids. So every Monday, always the same kids together. Every Tuesday, always the same kids because it's easier to look back and say, so-and-so was with so-and-so and then trace that way. I can't add anything to that. I, I think that's good advice. Uh, my children are grown. I don't have grandchildren, so I don't have a personal investment in this question. I honestly, I've talked to my husband about that and we're both very grateful that we're not facing that. That's a difficult decision. Some some people are privileged enough that someone can stay home with the children, but then there's still the question of so, socialization. What are the kids missing out on? It's 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 not easy, I'm sure. It's a it's an incredibly difficult decision to make. And uh, uh, in uh, September September 11th, uh, we will actually have the superintendent, Steve Zadrovic of Portsmouth School System and Sean Clancy from Great Bay Community College here to talk with us about those decisions and what it's going to look like in the Portsmouth School System and at Great Bay. So uh, it's, I, you know, I've said this all along that the, the people that I'm most concerned about are those people that have to make those difficult decisions, those parents that have to make those decisions, you know, these get uh, economic versus uh, health and uh, it's just, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. So um, Ben, I have another question unless somebody else is in queue ahead of me. Go ahead, Valerie. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Bianca, you we're talking about testing, and I wonder if you can tell us right now where the best places to get testing are, and is that a quick answer for you? Um, relatively so. I think there is, a, you can always contact, so in Portsmouth, starting in Portsmouth, that's easier. Portsmouth Regional Hospital, I think, did a uh, sort of um, a, a contract with the labs, Quest and others, and Incorp, uh, LabCorp. Um, and you can get tested through your primary care if it's in that system and then it can order for you. It's taking about two to three days. Uh, Convenient MD, Clear Choice also have. I think Rite Aid has a that drive through. I believe that Convenient MD and Clear Choice and Rite Aid, you can just show up. You don't need your PCP, Portsmouth Regional, you do. In, at, in Dover, I think Wentworth also has a similar system. Um, but has to go through your primary care. Um, in New York, it depends, um, it depends on who you are. If you're visiting, you can just show up at the drive through testing. If your primary care is in the area, the primary care, you have to call them first and get the primary care ordering. And if you're having tests, most places will check anyway before you have an elective procedure or a test. Like you're going to go for endoscopy. You've got to have a COVID test before. So we also have a list. We created a list, which I think it might be in the Citizens uh, Task Force website that has all the places are offering tests. And I think it's, it's, it, sh it, it tells which ones have antigen tests, antibody tests, the different types as well. Thank you. And I think that Ben just put up in the chat, he just put up the link to that uh, website, the city website. Yep. And another question while we're on the subject of tests came in. Um, are, are some tests better than others? And are there ones you should maybe steer away from? So as a, as there are different types of tests right now. There, most are swabs, some are nasal swabs and other oral pharyngeal. They are noticing that the ones that go into the nose, the nasal swabs are more sensitive than the oral pharyngeal swabs. 
So that's the top one recommended. There are also rapid testing that comes back within 15 to 30 minutes from Abbott, and they're the ones that are a little bit longer. So the false negative rate of the rapid test is a little bit higher um, than the regular one that looks at the, uh, the RNA from the virus. So if you can get the nasal swab sent to Quest or to the LabCorp, those are the best ones. And just a, a quick antibody does not, as a reminder, the antibody does not, if it's positive, doesn't mean you have the disease. It, it only means that you may have had the disease or came in contact with the virus. To know if you're infected currently, only the swabs. Uh, one more question. Uh, since you mentioned antibodies, uh, I was told that if you give blood to the Red Cross, um, an antibody test is included in that process now. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't know. I'm going to go get blood. I'll find out. I'll be the guinea pig. That's great. Let us know, Ben. Um, any other questions that are in queue? None right now. So I have one more. This might be a quick answer, too. Uh, what, uh, um, and I haven't looked this up. What's the current maximum group number that we're talking about for uh, one of the things that you mentioned? I think it was you, Anne. Um, stay, you know, stay away from crowds. We know about crowds, but what's the maximum number that they were considered safe right now? Ten people, fifty people. What is that? I I don't know that. I, if you're talking about regulations and where where masks are required. I, I don't know the answer, uh, but I would say the, the fewer, the better. I don't think there's one number, unless, Bianca, you want to uh, give I think that changed recently, especially in New Hampshire. Every state is different. Um, I think in New Hampshire, he lifted most of that, uh, and he's only creating the regulation now for gatherings over 100 people that need to wear masks. Mm -hmm. um, I know that he New Hampshire is allowing you for weddings. Uh, so I, I think initially it was less than 10, but that has changed and has been sort of uh, relaxed a little bit. Yes, but I, I think as we're looking at the winter and as we're looking at going indoors, there's a social aspect to that as well. You know, right now people can sit out in their driveways and meet with their neighbors and it's, you feel somewhat safe because you're outdoors. Once that option goes away or is limited, uh, folks are going to want to get together. And so looking, and I, I think we just need to pay attention to what does that number look like? You know, if I'm going to get together with, with four of my neighbors rather than 10 of my neighbors, uh, although we were joking in the task force the other day that now's the time to go out and buy your, your new ski outfits and your boots because it's going to be a run on those because people are going to be could be like toilet paper because people are going to be out buying them so they can be outside and socialize. So uh, I think it's just something that we need to watch is uh, and pay attention to because to Anne's point, we just we have to stay safely distanced. So uh, thank you for your answers there. So if there are no other questions, um, shall we try to wrap up here, Ben? Nothing else in the queue. Okay. Very good. So I, I cannot thank Anne and Bianca enough for making the time to be with us today. I know that they are both very, very busy people. And I know that they've already committed time and effort to the task force. So to ask them to come here on a Friday afternoon is, uh, um, I really appreciate the fact that you came. And of course, Russ has been sitting on these committees as well. And, uh, and I think the city manager's in the house now, and uh, she certainly has been as well as has Stephanie. So uh, there's an awful lot of people who are putting an awful lot of time and effort into this, and we certainly appreciate all that you're doing for that and for sharing what, what your expertise with us because we don't have, sorry, we don't have that in our own, uh, in our own baskets here. So thank you. And, and I want to thank everybody else for joining us today too. It, it's a, it's it looks like a gorgeous Friday afternoon out there, and thank you for coming in and hanging out with us right now. Um, I do want to tell you that the uh, you know that we've revised our schedule. We're not doing Friday every week. We are doing the second and fourth Fridays of the month. So this is the second Friday on the fourth Friday, August twenty eighth. We will have Superintendent Steve Zadrick and. Uh, I think he's vice president of operations now, Ben, you might correct me, but Sean Clancy from Great Bay Community College. 
And I know that we have asked the deputy superintendent, uh, George, to George. join us. George, that's right, George, to join us as well. So um, we've had them on before, and uh, they'll be talking to us about um, the, the difficult choices that parents are making right now and what they can expect in those school systems. So that's on the 28th. And then on September 11th, we're going to be very happy to also uh, welcome Patricia Tilley, who's the Deputy Director of the New Hampshire Division of Public Health Services in the Department of Health and Human Services. And she's going to be talking exactly what you're talking about, Bianca, the testing, the contact tracing. And she's going to deal directly also with what our responsibilities are as businesses. If one of our staff or somebody affiliated with our staff or one of our customers or guests tests positive, what do we do? What are we required to do? What are we... Uh, what should we do? And uh, she'll go through all of that with us. I saw her recently in a presentation and it was, it was really interesting into, uh, you know, what are our obligations? How do we keep people safe? And then how do we message that out to folks that we are keeping people safe? So um, that will be on September 11th. So a couple of other quick things before we get into the fun stuff. Uh, we've already talked about, I, I had uh, reminders about wearing a mask and safe distance and all that as well. So I'm going to reiterate that. Um, the MERV 15 filters, we just put those into our building as well, Russ. So I think that's right, you know, in talking with our HVAC folks, they said that was a good start. And that's not an expensive option. So I would highly recommend that you call your HVAC people and say, how do I get those MERV 13 filters? It's the top, the top end of filtration. So uh, take a look at those. Uh, masks, going back to masks for just a second, you may have seen them pom popping up around town on faces that you wouldn't expect. On some of our statues and some of our barriers, you're seeing them pop up around town. And, you know, the small band of people that are doing that, and I'm not going to mention their names, will I, Anne and Karen? No, not going to mention them. But it's giving us a little smile when we, when we walk around town. So thank you for that. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you to our speakers and all of our guests. Bye-bye.